three, two, one. Some say youth is wasted on the young, but then there are some that use it as fuel to burn blue flame hot in business and end up employing thousands, making millions, and affecting the lives of billions. People the world over know those entrepreneurs by last name only. Zuckerberg, Gates, Musk. And if you haven't already, it's time to add our guest on Venture the World today to your list, Ian Aboyeji. He co-founded Flutterwave, Y Combinator's most valuable African startup, and Andela, a software training and development firm, both considered companies that will be crowned the next crop of unicorns after raising millions. We begin our conversation in the halls of University of Waterloo, where Ian started and he details how he identifies co-founders, pitches top Silicon Valley investors, and is now building the next big thing with Future Africa Fund, investing in Africa's game-changing companies, building a better future for the world. If you ever wondered what the journey of a serial entrepreneur really looks like, or wanted to get funding from Aboyeji's rolling VC fund, Future Africa, then this episode is for you. After the show, please go to our website at venturetheworld.com or africa.businessinsider.com for additional information related to Ian Aboyeji and all of our other guests. This episode of Venture the World is made in partnership with Business Insider Africa, the leading Pan-African innovative business news provider targeting aspirational business leaders and featuring the latest innovation, technology, and business news from Africa, alongside features on lifestyle, markets, and more verticals. Today on Venture the World, we have our illustrious guest, Ian, or as some people call him, E. He's one of the top founders throughout Africa. We're really excited. I'm personally, I'm very excited to be able to speak to you today, especially because your story is very well known throughout African startup circles, but a lot of people don't know about the businesses that you have created in Africa and your storied history in the African startup landscape. So I'm glad to introduce you and what you're working on today. Yeah. Awesome. We're excited to have you on We've been anxious to speak with you. We have questions in from Idris Bello from African Preneur Fund and Chris Wallace of Greycroft 3C, and we thank them for their contributions. Before we get started, and we referenced this in the intro, but can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came to start the companies that you have and what brought you to Future Africa Fund today? So I've been in the venture game for 10 years, started in university. The way I came up on venture was actually pretty fortuitous. By venture, I mean entrepreneurship, not venture capital. So I had a friend who I met on the first day of school. Funny incident was he asked me to stay at mine the first day of school because he had some accommodation issues. And then we became friends after that. His name was Pierre. We lost touch because my school runs something called cooperative education program. So pretty much you spend three months out of a year in school and the rest of it working for an employer. And he had the luck of going to work in Silicon Valley for an employer with a company called Adapar, which was run by a guy called Joe Lonsdale, who's part of the PayPal mafia. He had gone and I had gone into the publishing world. I was running the school newspaper and we just jammed one day in second year. And he was telling me all this stuff about his life in Silicon Valley and how amazing it was and how they slept on the desks to get products out. It was, it was amazing. And I loved it, even though it sounded terrible on further recollection. I was intrigued by it. And around the same time, The Social Network, which was about Mark Zuckerberg, came out and we went and watched it together. And I was so determined after that, that we were going to start a successful company. And we did. We started a successful company. We started a company that didn't end up being very successful called BookNetto.com. BookNetto.com ended up getting sold to a third-party investor. But that was pretty much how I caught the bug. And from then on, I was pretty much unemployable. I moved to Nigeria in 2013 to try to do another e-learning company. That didn't work out because of regulation. And it's amazing to see now that the Ministry of Education, which um, has been a stumbling block against e-learning, all of a sudden has to adapt it right away. It's amazing blessings of the, of the COVID-19. But we pivoted and started to sell MBA programs online MBA programs. And that worked out until I met Jeremy in New York after also another long hiatus. We had been friends before and reconnected. And we started Andela, 
Whose well story is well known together. I say this to say, if I hadn't met Pierre, I would be a professor of competition law, suing governments for discriminating against foreign companies. Wow. That's two quite different paths. Yeah, exactly. So you were in Canada, right? <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah. And then I was in Waterloo. So you came from Nigeria, you went to Canada, and you were a student, and you caught the entrepreneurship bug. That's a story that really needs to be double clicked on. When you were doing that and your story of starting a business and then going a little bit further and selling that business, did you see other people on the same path? Yeah. Like, how did you know that you could do this and not feel unfettered by anything else? That's a great question. I'll tell you one experience I had, which was pretty amazing. When I got to Canada in 2010, BlackBerry was on the decline. And anybody who knows University of Waterloo and the Waterloo community well knows that BlackBerry was the center of this community since 1994. So that was all people did. People worked for BlackBerry their whole lives. And we're a really strange town. You know, you went to Waterloo or Laurier and then worked for BlackBerry the rest of your life and never saw the outside world. iPhone basically killed BlackBerry. I had a bit of a front seat to that disaster. And then people were wondering, okay, what's next? What happens to this region? Now, there was an entrepreneur called Ted Livingston, but he started a company called Kick. They're still alive. He had the foresight to invest in the region by creating this fellowship called Velocity at the University of Waterloo. And I was part of the Velocity program, the first class of Velocity people. Other people like Pebble, I don't know if you guys remember that, Wearable Watch, Pebble came out of that. I think I was there at the same time as Vitalik who invented Ethereum, I think. No one ever knows when famous people. <laughs> there was a bunch of other companies like Pair Mobile. They were back in the day when the rage was having an app you shared only with your wife or with your significant other. They were the first to do one-to-one -one apps. It's kind of a strange idea. But anyway, there are a lot of amazing companies founded at that time. One of those companies was Bufferbox. Now, one day, we used to have a joke. We work five to nine, which means you start your work at 5 a.m. in the morning. And you work till 9 p.m. And then sometimes you even stayed overnight. So I came into the office super early one morning. And so my office was cordoned off. And I was, okay, what's going on here? Did somebody die? Because at the time, also, it was very depressing. People were really depressed, to be honest. Because it was just a hard journey. And entrepreneurship wasn't easy for anybody. And people were butting their heads against the wall. So I thought maybe somebody finally caputed. And then I asked the police, what's going on? And they were, oh, we can talk about it now. So I went to Tim Hortons right next door and just hung there for a bit. And then I came out around eight when I suspected more people would be around. And they were telling me, oh, you didn't hear about the news. It's on all the newspapers. Buffer Box, which was sitting right next to you, got bought by Google for $30 million. And that experience, I never forgot. And it completely changed my view of entrepreneurship. Because if these guys can do it, they were right beside me. I can do it too. So I'm going to die trying at this thing. So that really shaped my approach to entrepreneurship where seeing all these possibilities happen so close to me made me more aware of the fact that it was possible to do. And then I read a book that I still recommend to new entrepreneurs today. The book is about founders. I think it's called Founders at Work. It's a really good book. It just tells you the stories of 30 different innovators. This is how they started. This is what they did. And you, these people are no smarter than me or there's no special whatever that they're doing. So that made it more relatable for me. So I think that those were the experiences that really shaped me. Waterloo did a great job with respect to entrepreneurship. Okay, so you already had a startup. You met Jeremy Johnson, who had just exited um, his own education startup at 2U. Well, at the time, you know what was really funny about when I met him? He hadn't yet exited. He had just taken it public. Yeah. So even the meeting itself was a miracle because, so here's the guy, his birthday was the week of, and he just IPO'd the company and he still found time to meet with me. I wasn't expecting him to have time, honestly. So you have this meeting and you're telling them about your concept. Yeah. Had he ever been to Nigeria before or were you telling him about this land of opportunity and convinced him in the room? Yeah, I mean, he'd never been to Nigeria before, but he had been to Kenya and he had started to get a glimpse of how Africa worked. There was a lot of selling to do, but it wasn't hard because Nigeria is the kind of place where if you're radically honest about the place, the other person can make a decision. It's, it's a place of incredible opportunity and incredible challenges. Yeah, I mean, I always say that if you're ranking hard, medium and light for countries in Africa, Nigeria is Africa medium, not Africa hard. Africa medium. Medium, that sounds very generous. I would have said, is there something more difficult than hard? But the thing that makes Nigeria work is that it's worth the risk. You know what I mean? 
And if you get it right in Nigeria, it's literally like being DDoS. Everything seems like a joke to you when you go to like Kenya and Ghana and no one's trying to cheat you, you know? <laughs> so I, I feel like when you make something work in Nigeria, no one can stop you anywhere else on the continent. At least that's been my experience. So Andela has become this massive, almost a unicorn in Africa. And then you leave that and I guess you get the bug and you start Flutter Wave. How, how, how did that happen? One of the big pushes I, was, I had at Andela was servicing more local clients. And I was trying to understand why we weren't getting more software jobs from the local startup community. And, and it boiled down to they couldn't make money, basically. And most of them had to rely on partnerships or subscription or service agreements with larger companies. And if you have one customer, why do you need payments? We, we engaged in particular with this bank, Access Bank, while I was at Andela and tried to build them something called Pay with Capture. And I met them for Flutterwave on that project. And you, we talked a lot. I was guiding their account. I was trying to help them see opportunities, trying to you know, identify challenges and build rapport. And it just occurred to me that the problem they were solving was really important, but I wasn't quite made up yet. I had a lot of options after doing Andela, and I wanted to pursue some of those options, including going to business school. And then what happened was the guys at Pay with Capture then put out this event where it was like a three-hour show where they were all just complaining about payments. I think Honey Ogudeng was there, Oo was there, a bunch of other folks in the ecosystem. And I was sick to my stomach, man. I was like, you guys are going to sit here for three hours and just complain about payments? And so I was like, if we solve this payment issue, you're all good, right? Like, we're all good. And it was like, yeah, this is the only problem we have. I was like, okay, no problem. That day, I just knew I was going to have to leave Andela and go and solve that problem. To be fair, they were right. Solving the payments issue unlocked a whole bunch of opportunity for the entire ecosystem that we're still enjoying to this day. So on both Andela and Flutterwave, you've raised money and were you able to expand to different African countries, basically experiencing those different regional markets? Yeah. So how did you decide when doing that, when to enter those new countries? You were building these businesses, they were raising capital. Yeah. How, how were those decisions made to expand? Um, yeah, it's usually a matrix, and the matrix is, on the one hand, what's the size of the market? Nobody wants to go into a very small market that can't take on their costs. Then the other question is usually, what's the opportunity in the market? Which means, which customers are there and ready to welcome you with open hands? Which partners are there and ready to welcome you with open hands? Sometimes, which governments are there and ready to welcome you with open hands? So that's the other thing. And then I'll, I'll say the third factor was really one of being able to find the talent to be able to kick off in that country. So in some countries, you just couldn't find the talent and you didn't have anybody that was prepped enough or ready to move to another country. So those three things we would basically matrix and then figure out what works and then attempt an experiment and see how it goes before we then do a full-blown launch. Okay, and then that brings us to the future Africa yeah, uh, I remember reaching out to you on Twitter and telling you after you said that you were leaving Flutterway, saying that if you started a venture studio or anything like that, there will be plenty of dollars that want to follow you. The way it worked out for me was I, I had a kid and I wanted to be very close to home. As much as venture is amazing and, and I love it. It does take it so long, especially when you're building at the speed we're building at. And I wanted to just take a break and do something that was just not tech or venture. But the reality was there was just this gaping hole in the market. And the more I saw capital flow in, the more alarmed I was, even though I was excited about it, because the capital flowing in was reducing seed funding. Basically, we have this chart where capital is flowing in, so there's more capital, but seed funding as a proportion of capital is reducing, which makes no sense because if there's more capital, aren't these people thinking about pipeline? Aren't they thinking about who they're going to invest in next? Are they all going to just crowd at the top and blow up the valuations and then come back five years later and say it was all a bubble? And so I became more and more alarmed. Is it because the types of capital is changing? Is there a difference in the type of capital? Is it more debt capital or mezzanine, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I think it's who's delivering the capital. So we went through this phase in Africa where we started with the aid gap, right? Which is cool. They were happy to fund small innovative projects for free. And, and that's cool. However, 
it's not enough, right? Obviously. And so we went into this stage where we had a lot of ex-MBA capital that followed Rocket into the market. And a lot of that capital has been dominant for the last, I would say, eight to 10 years. And so when the growth opportunity finally arrived, for whatever reason, they took that lens to the market. And they weren't necessarily making decisions on the basis of market need, but just on the basis of capital opportunity, which completely changes the equation. So I think that was a real problem with the capital. It wasn't that it wasn't ambitious or it wasn't good for the ecosystem. It was just the people deploying it just didn't understand tech. Were the backgrounds of the people that were bringing in or the institutions or individuals that were bringing this type of money in, did they come from a different place? Because it seems like before they were all around the tech area or VC area. Now, was it more banks or was it larger institutions? We had two broad categories of people. I would say there were the MBA types who had, who had set up PE funds before and now wanted to get into VC because they thought the valuations were better. And then you still had a bunch of the DFI type people who were just morphing into tech because they felt their sources of capital were cheaper. Okay, that, that makes sense. So our listeners might see that this is also a struggle around the world and something that happens a lot. So I just want to point it out because it defines what you're working on next. It's, it was who was giving the capital away. The capital was always there, it was always needed, you know what I mean? But you just had the wrong set of people in control of the capital, in my opinion. You're basically saying that the market, the funding market was being dictated less by the pipeline of companies, but more by the LPs, the limited partners that were providing funds to- And, and their risk appetite, which is why you saw that inverted map of seed funding decreasing year over year, while general funding is increasing, which is ridiculous. That is very important. So in this process of you navigating, raising local capital, I, I know some angels that you raise capital from, and then also raising VC and also impact capital, you have a lot of experience in terms of that capital stack of blended capital um, and people with divergent interests in terms of what outcomes they're actually looking for. I mean, I don't know if they have divergent interests. I just think they have a certain mindset about how capital should work, which is why you need operators who understand how technology businesses work to guide them towards the outcomes. Because none of these guys are going to turn away a 25 times return if they can get it. So I don't know if they have divergent interests. <laughs> so the, the returns will make everyone happy at the end of the day. I mean, that, that's what we're here for, right? We <laughs> want to make impact, mm -hmm. but primarily we all speak the language of return, right? It seems speaking with a lot of founders, there's a preoccupation with African early stage founders with making their mark by achieving a headline that they've raised a funding round to the extent that some people will make up some type of headline so that they do it. What have you learned about raising capital that you can share with folks about the local landscape of African angels and U.S. capital? And then also as a business matures, what things have you learned and how are you translating that to your new fund? There's a lot of things that I've learned about capital. The biggest misconception people have is that anybody gets in the capital stack on their own. In the sense that, you know, that you can just be a fresh newbie and just enter the capital stack on the basis of quote unquote merit. The reality is capital is primarily a relationships business and trust business. A lot of the times you need somebody who can introduce you to the capital stack, somebody that the capital stack trusts. And I find it very funny how a lot of founders don't consider other founders who've already raised capital as the best resources there. I know there are challenges with some founders not being willing to offer support. But my first instinct, knowing what I know about capital raising, whenever I want to raise money, is to go and talk to the investors that that person invested in. Yeah, to the entrepreneurs that that investor invested in. <laughs> because there's no better, except they have a frosty relationship or something, there's no better reference. A lot of people just skip that step and just believe that they can just cold email VCs and they'll answer them. You're pr pretty much giving founders a cheat code that they should look at the portfolios or crunch base, look at the people that have made investments, talk to the founders that have made announcements, build relationships with them, ask for intros to those investments. Exactly. Yeah, because I know all the investors that I invested in all my companies on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know what I mean? 
And obviously, I, like as a person of integrity, I wouldn't recommend every single startup who came to me, except I thought they were exceptional. But like, if I think something is exceptional, that thing is more or less likely to get funded because I know the guys and you know, I know how they think and I know what's important to them because I used to work for them basically as a founder. And seeing all of these changes over the continent over the past uh, decade, what are some of those key major changes that our listeners could pull out and say, wow, these are the three things that really changed in the entrepreneurship community in Africa. And then what are you looking forward to, the top couple things you're looking forward to changing over the next decade? I would say the first thing that really hit me was Paystack's entry into Y Combinator. That was a game changer. And to be honest, only one person gets credit for that, and that's Oo Moye. In reality, I mean, apart from the Paystack team for being awesome, of course. But that opened up a floodgate of validation because there was no otherwise any other path out of the Nigerian investor ecosystem into a global ecosystem where people were more willing than our local investors to believe in the possibilities of the market and its entrepreneurs. So I think that was a big game changer that perhaps went unnoticed, but was definitely a game changer. The second maybe big game changer was, and I'm not saying this in order of chronology, but was Mark Zuckerberg's visit to Nigeria, right? Because that put Nigeria solidly in the global investor map, but more importantly, it validated Nigerian talent. Because everybody started to think if these guys are good enough for Mark Zuckerberg to invest in a company that hires Nigerian talent, uh, who the hell am I? I? This guy is a billionaire. I'm just a startup founder in Germany with three guys. And these guys are cheaper and they're smart. And Mark Zuckerberg thinks they're awesome. So I think they're awesome too. That was another very big shift, right? I mean, what Andela was doing was game changing in, in and of itself. but when Mark Zuckerberg kind of arrived on the scene to validate what Andela was doing, it changed the game globally and opened up the market in ways that none of us ever suspected would happen. Basically making Nigerian technology talent a global export. That was impossible without a Mark Zuckerberg in endorsement. And maybe the last thing I would say is Opera's entry into the market because I think since Jumia, which did it in a more progressive way and without as much operational finesse, they were never, I feel like Jumia was big, but not as big, in my opinion. Like a lot of the money they raised went to paying MBAs and stuff like that. But, and it wasn't as consumer a brand as people might have wanted it to be. But Opera did a big thing in the sense that it dawned on people all of a sudden that large sums of money could be deployed in this market fairly successful. Before then, like, even if you said you were raising $100 million, what most people were willing to con countenance was, oh, you have a big development team in, in the U.S. or a sales team in the U.S., so you need that money. But no one was willing to countenance, we can actually acquire a shit ton of customers from this, right, with cash. And I think Opera changed the game there. So people are thinking very differently about how to deploy capital for consumer products as a result of Opera's big moves. So I'll say those are like three of the biggest ones. There are obviously other things. I would argue a lot of payment startups that came into the scene were super pivotal in growing other parts of the ecosystem and attracting investments because it's very easy for investors to see where the flows from payments will come from. And then the rise of crowdfunding in agriculture and savings platforms also helps. But I would say the three big changes would be Y Combinator, Mark Zuckerberg, and opera, the Chinese. I used to work at Alibaba in China, so I, I know that piece pretty well. What are a couple things that you're really excited about for the next 10 years? What are some big things that you think may uh, be on the horizon? I'll say the first thing I hope happens is more kind of the backdrop to, to the product we just launched, the Future Africa Collective, which is our community of investors and African innovators. We want to see more regular people invest in companies. Our thesis is very simple, right? Number one, we have a perfect storm from an investment standpoint in the sense that there aren't enough yield producing investment opportunities in Nigeria specifically. So banks are rejecting fixed deposits here because they have to meet CRR requirements um, of 70% and they don't know where to put credit. That's the cash reserve. Cash reserve in Nigeria, right, yeah. Um, so they're rejecting your deposits. Treasury bills are 5%. 
So the traditional argument against venture in Africa was, A, they're better yielding instruments. Now they aren't, <laughs> right? There's nothing, nothing's doing better than venture right now. And so more people are going to look to venture or equities or the global market as a way to get out of the Naira and still operate, right? However, the institutions don't understand venture and they're not prepared to offer this asset class to their investor base. So people are going to find the products themselves. So I think you're going to see a more democratized VC, which puts a lot of LPs and ICs that have become gods unto themselves in real trouble. Because if, if I'm a talented manager, right, why would I go and grovel to you and outsource my decision making and my entrepreneurial talent and skills and operational skill sets to you when I can just recommend companies to a community of investors and earn exactly the same carry and fees, maybe even better. Are you sourcing your investors from a mix of U.S. and, and international investors or primarily locally? We're not targeting our efforts specifically. We're just putting the information out there. But what we're seeing, though, is we have a lot of diaspora who are engaged and are investing. We have some younger Nigerians who have savings and want to invest, who work and they don't have time to manage a portfolio, but they're excited about tech and want to invest in tech. I want an easy way to do so. And we also know there's quite a bit of VCs in the West who are excited about Africa and want to use this as an opportunity to learn. Okay, interesting. So I remember Michael Siebel from Y Combinator, now CEO, came to Nigeria and at a dinner, he said that there's an opportunity for local early stage seed, call it seed, call it angel investors that would be able to front run, for lack of a better word, the accelerator process of 500 startups and Y Combinator. And to do that, to increase the valuations and validation of their early stage investment. Is that something that you had in mind or is it more like you see just all these opportunities and this friction of angels with founders and then also other market opportunities. What laid the groundwork that you said with the opportunity? We've been investing for a long time, since 2005. And so we've seen a lot. We've definitely seen what Michael Siebel is talking about. So we've seen the investing in startups that have the potential to get into accelerator programs like 500 and Y Combinator and then watching the valuations rise with that bet. And it works. It works. It, it's worked well for us in many cases where we were that lucky. But I don't think that's the only bet we will make, right? Because there's not enough of them. I mean, Y Combinator and 500 have never historically taken in more than 10 Nigerian startups at any time. Investor capital, I don't think it's just 10 companies that can get it. And also, oftentimes, it takes a leap of faith in any case because no one has any undue influence on the YC application process or 500 application process such that you can determine for real whether you get in or not. You, know, you have the same number of slots as everybody. And once they get into the accelerators, they're giving cash, so they don't really need your cash at that point. And it behoves them to wait till the end of the program, except you're really going to be adding a lot of value. Your Future Africa Fund is invested in Nigeria or all around? And what do you see as the potential scale that you can obtain over the next five years? Where do you want to be? So in terms of where we are, we're investing all over Africa, all over, not just in Nigeria. We think that we can pioneer this new way of venture capital that prioritizes entrepreneurs with operational skill and a business understanding over MBA types who have a network to raise capital from. And I think that would be the biggest thing that happened to capital on the continent. Once you can help Africa make that shift, where innovators are back to be innovators as opposed to just finance types and suits. And I think that might bring it in. For us, our primary goal is really, with this particular product, is really doing that. But for future Africa as an ecosystem, I think what we're trying to go towards is really a community of innovators that we can partner with to establish a future where, an African future in particular, where prosperity and purpose is within everyone's reach. So for us, what really matters is access to opportunity for people, flattening of the Gini coefficient, 
right? Uh, reduction of inequalities. And we think technology can move us towards that world of abundance where 60% of the world's population living in Africa, but also living in an African future, um, able to work remotely, able to live without fear, and so on and so forth. So that's really where we're after. We have a bunch of numbers-based milestones, but I think my experience with building businesses is that within a few weeks or months or whatever, we will always blow those milestones out of the water. But what matters more is the general impact of the system that you deliver and how it becomes the way to do African venture in Africa. That's really what we're after. We want to be a model for how venture is done in Africa going forward. So that's really ambitious. One of the questions that we got from one of your investors, Idris Bello, says, how do you see opportunities in this time of crisis and going forward? What I would say is COVID-19 on the surface has accelerated our digital future. So because of the physical distancing guidelines, a lot of us have to leave virtually, quite frankly. We work from home, try as much as possible to leverage digital technology and avoid contact with others. There is a reason to do this. And quite frankly, the science supports that. And even if the governments decide to relax the restrictions, it will behove people who are smart to still continue to maintain these restrictions for their own safety and health. That's how I see it. However, the performance of one entrepreneur to another will vary, not necessarily because of the industry that the entrepreneur is in, but because of their attitude and because of their willingness to adapt and willingness to own the crisis and turn into something that is meaningful for them. If you are mentally defeated by the crisis, there is nothing for you. It doesn't matter if you're in an industry that should ordinarily, on the surface, enjoy the benefits of something like this. If you're not proactive in taking action and seeking opportunity at this time, it will not come to you. I think that's really the biggest lesson for me is I'm looking for entrepreneurs who see opportunity in all the present chaos, right? And I'm willing to solve problems to help people continue to live their lives as normally as they can, even though we know there's no normal anymore. But if we can support people to adjust to a new normal, that's great. Very exciting for me to have you on this podcast and for our listeners to have you on. And we hope we can have you on soon as the things that you talked about that you're going to be doing over the next couple of years and the developments in Africa and really to follow Future Africa Fund. We hope to have you back on and talk about the successes of the next couple of years. Thank mm -hmm. you for being on the podcast. Three, two, one. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. To find more episodes, visit VentureTheWorld.com. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at VTW underscore HQ. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review, which will help other listeners like you venture the world. Thanks. Thanks.